I'm really delighted today to introduce Ting Hui Lao, who is a newly appointed assistant professor of anthropology at Yale and U.S. College. Um, and I consider uh, Ting to be a, a friend and colleague. I got to know Ting a little bit uh, during my year, the, the tail end of my year in Singapore when I was teaching as a visiting faculty at Yale and U.S. Um, before she had started her position there. Um, and so I'm really excited to know that she's taking up the position there uh, because I think she's gonna do important things to um, complement the already strong anthropology department there. Um, she recently received her PhD in anthropology from Cornell and she is already in the process of finalizing a book manuscript entitled Wounds of Progress, Colonial Development and the Politics of Affliction on the China-Myanmar border. And the dissertation fieldwork, which informs the book, is built on a decade of engagement and two years of continuous fieldwork with Lisu subsistence farmers. And Ting has earned a reputation in Southeast Asian studies for her tenacity as a field worker in notoriously difficult field environments. Colleagues I know from Cornell and others who know about her work constantly rave about the importance of her project which rethinks the violent colonial dimensions of development, which in this area, instead of delivering poverty reduction, has inadvertently perpetuated high rates of violence, alcoholism, disease, and mental illness, which are interpreted by the Lisu as forms of haunting, curses, and demon madness. Um, really important and fascinating work by a really important rising new scholar in Southeast Asian studies. So uh, please join me in welcoming Ting for the talk today entitled Conjuring Spirits, the Melancholic Play of Alcohol Drinking Lisu Men on the China-Myanmar Border. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Eric, for the uh, very kind introduction. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. It's uh, such a great honor to have a chance to share my work with the Southeast Asian Studies community in Yale. Um, and I'm really extremely grateful for the opportunity Today, I will be sharing a chapter from my book in progress, Wounds of Progress, Colonial Development and the Politics of Affliction. The book examines development and affliction among indigenous Lisu men in the New River Valley on the China-Myanmar border. Following a group of Lisu men in their struggle with chronic pain, alcoholism and madness, I examined the social and political forces that give rise to these afflictions, as well as the ways that Lisu regenerate from them. The chapter I will be talking about today focuses on alcohol drinking and what Lisu term alcohol madness, Jipeme. Do you see my next slide? Alcohol drinking gatherings are common across Lisu villages in the New River Valley. These gatherings last between a few hours and a week during which the men do not work and hardly eat, spending their nights and days drinking, role-playing, telling stories, and singing, they descend into alcohol madness. When thus possessed, the men are no longer authors of their own words, but speak on behalf of the spirit, me. Straddling the space between the living and the dead, the alcohol madmen haunt villagers with their laughter, maniacal speeches, and uncanny cries for the lost souls of forgotten ancestors. This paper examines alcohol drinking as a form of melancholic play through which non-Christian Lisu men refuse indigenous cultural erasure under Chinese development and Christian missionization. Lisu in the valley have long had to grapple with the dual colonial forces of Christian missionization and Chinese state encroachment. Christianity was introduced by foreign missionaries in the early 20th century, while Chinese state encroachment has been ongoing for centuries, accelerating since the 1950s. Both these ideologies of progress consider indigenous Lisu ritual practices, such as alcohol drinking, as backward and civilized and uncivilized. These propagandas reify a static image of the Lisu and contribute to Lisu cultural loss and dignity loss. 
I show how non-Christian alcohol drinking men refuse such ideologies. Gathering to drink and play, the men infuse melancholia with play, humor, and laughter and keep supposedly bygone practices alive through the partial revitalization of old alcohol drinking rituals. This analysis joins scholars Eurocentric ideas about melancholia as pathological. So the conventional idea, the conventional Freudian idea that uh, melancholia is a incomplete grief, uh, grief that is uh, unhealthy because the mourning can never be uh, concluded. Situating these two experiences of loss in relation to historical colonialism, my analysis shows how the pathology lies not in these two relationships with loss, but in the colonial processes undergirding loss. In this context, melancholia is not a passive inability to embrace change, but an active unwillingness to move on. The talk is organized into four parts. I will begin with a brief introduction of the colonial dynamics animating the ethnographic context in which I work. Next, I discuss alcohol within the triad of Lisu indigenous cultural paradigms, Christianity, and Chinese development, following which I delve into a night of drinking and melancholic play with a group of non-Christian alcohol drinking men. And finally, I close this talk with a brief discussion on listening to affliction and the implications of such forms of listening for public health interventions. So I'm gonna begin with a brief discussion on the ethnographic context to set the scene. The Lisu are an indigenous people living dispersed across the highlands of mainland Southeast Asia, along the borders of China, Myanmar, Thailand, and India. My ethnography focuses on the Lisu in the New River Valley on the China-Myanmar border. As you can see, the, uh, the river follows the blue line there. The valley is formally within the borders of the Chinese state, but geographically located in the highlands of mainland Southeast Asia, a region referred to by some scholars as Zomia. Scholars have defined Zomia as a vast fluid zone where communities have historically fled to escape state rule. The Lisu are one of the many indigenous communities residing in this transborder terrain. The New River Valley is the traditional territory of many indigenous peoples with the Lisu constituting one of the largest communities. Like many countries in Asia, China does not recognize the existence of indigenous groups within its borders. The Lisu are classified by the Chinese Communist government as one of the officially recognized 55 ethnic minorities. But the Lisu experience of cultural erasure and political marginalization under Chinese assimilationist ethnic policies resonates with the struggles of indigenous communities elsewhere. As Alfred and Contassel argue, it is the oppositional place-based place existence along with the consciousness of being in struggle against the dispossessing and demeaning fact of colonization by foreign peoples that fundamentally distinguishes indigenous peoples from other peoples of the world. This article connects the Lisu's struggle with the experiences of indigenous communities elsewhere to relativize Chinese ethnic classifications to underscore the psychic and cultural experience of being Lisu. Like other indigenous communities residing in this transborder highland region, the Lisu wrestle with multiple colonial forces, including state civilizational projects, economic development, and, region, uh, and religious missionization. These processes have estranged Lisu from their traditional ritual practices, which they call practices of the earlier days. These include making offerings to the spirits, niti, soul calling, haku, spirit dancing, niki, and sorcery, nixia, and resemble those carried out by other indigenous communities in the region. When I began my dissertation fieldwork in 2015, I came eager to learn about Lisu ritual life. But many of my Lisu interlocutors treated my questions about rituals as inquiries about the past. 
they explained that these rituals, which often involved alcohol, were pre-Christian practices that were no longer being followed. As with many Christianized indigenous communities, the introduction of Christianity effectively divided history into two distinct parts, pre-Christianity and post-Christianity. Today, the majority of Lisu in the Valley practice indigenized Protestant Christianity. All Christian activities must be endorsed by the Central Church, which is part of the state-sanctioned three-self Protestant Church. Although some Lisu practice alternative non-state-sanctioned forms of Christianity, they are actively persecuted by the Chinese Communist Party and have become a minority. Despite government surveillance of Christian activities, many Christian Lisu continue to relate to Christianity as something beyond full government control. Christianity remains an important source of power, healing, and resistance against Chinese state hegemony. But dominant Lisu Christian ideology also have many structural parallels with Chinese ideologies of development, including a linear notion of time and progress. Christian Lisu reproduce Chinese domination in many ways. For example, Lisu Christians' uh, linear conception of time and progress denigrate non-Christians as primitive demon worshippers. Although many Lisu Christian practices are similar to traditional rituals, Christian Lisu work hard to differentiate themselves from non-Christians. Lisu Christianity forbids smoking, gambling, telling non-Christian once upon a time origin story, stories, animani tatiami, and above all, drinking alcohol. Many Christian Lisu hesitate even to share memories of traditional cosmologies and rituals for fear of being labeled unfaithful and being ostracized by the Christian community. Certainly, Christian Lisu have a complex and contextual relationship with non-Christian Lisu practices and people, but a defining characteristic of many Christian Lisu is the constant cultural work they do to distance themselves from their supposedly sinful non-Christian Lisu paths. The rise of Christianity has occurred alongside rapid Chinese development. Like many ethnic communities in contemporary China, Lisu have negotiated with the civilizing mission of encroaching Chinese state power for centuries. In the communist era, rapid Chinese development has further appended the ways of life of the Lisu and other minorities with accelerating upheaval since the 2000s. Like Christianity, Chinese development discourses deny the coevalness of Lisu indigenous life worlds. While Christianity is recognized by many Lisu and Chinese people as a modern foreign religion, Lisu indigenous ritual practices are labeled as primitive. Many Lisu have internalized this ideology of contempt. Through residential schooling, factory work, and urbanization, Lisu are being recruited into the Chinese state bureaucracy, market economy, and Han majority society. These assimilationist programs have gained intensity in recent years. Since, 2000, uh, since 2011, Chinese ethnic policies have adopted a fiercer assimilationist stance towards its ethnic minority populations. In this context, the arenas in which minority ways of life can be recognized have narrowed to the domains of tourism or ethnological research. That is, Lisu traditional practices are being petrified into static objects for tourists and research consumption. Lisu are thus simultaneously being assimilated into the dominant Chinese society and being objectified into artifacts. So my next section talks about alcohol um, and how, how alcohol works within this context. Um, I, I titled this The Gift of Alcohol and it's the gift from the ancestors. Alcohol lies at the center of the triadic relationship between Lisu indigenous cultural paradigms, Christianity, and Chinese development. Once a sacred item used during important rituals, alcohol was respected as a powerful substance by the Lisu. Traditionally, among many Lisu, alcohol was seen as a gift from the spirits. 
a powerful medium that connects humans to non-humans and transforms sadness to joy. Accepting the gift of alcohol binds the Lisu person to a reciprocal relationship with the spirits. Lisu sorcerers Nipa were people who knew how to wield the power of alcohol to communicate with spirits. My Lisu interlocutors described how sorcerers used alcohol as means to summon the spirits. With the aid of the assembled spirits, these sorcerers could deserving punishment and sought justice for those who were wrong. Alcohol was used in healing rituals, for example. It was also used in uh, healing rituals. For example, if a soul left the body after a frightening encounter, skillful sorcerers could sometimes reunite the lost souls with their host bodies through alcohol-mediated rituals. But for those who were less skillful, alcohol could be overpowering. It could deceive. If a person was unable to control the voices of the spirits, alcohol consumption could lead to temporary or permanent madness, ni mei, or spirit-induced epilepsy, ni zhi zhi. Out of respect for the powerful spirits, Li Su made offerings of alcohol and meat to the spirits to honor their reciprocal ties. But as indigenous Lisu ritual paradigms and practices eroded with conversion to Christianity under Chinese development, so did the status of alcohol. The sacred relationship with alcohol has changed significantly with development and conversion to Christianity. Alcohol is now rejected by Christians as a poison that tempts and contaminates. The yulu 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 speech of drunk men are the words of the demons within them rather than the human animating the body. The alcohol drinkers are no longer seen as skillful sorcerers, but as useless drunkards, or worse yet, Satan's underlings. Christian Lisu instead accept another kind of gift, Le Xu, the gift of eternal life, Semia Zamu, from God, Wu Sa. Embracing God's grace, they seek to break away from their supposedly demonic past, which alcohol recalls. Similarly, Chinese development discourses often portray minority people like the Lisu as people who drink too much and who are ungrateful. Under Chinese and Christian ideologies of progress, alcohol drinking Lisu are reified as primitive or damaged people and their spirits and the spirits they mingle with are branded as demonic or dismissed as superstitious delusions. Hypocritically, the Han majority sees mainstream drinking in Han society as masculine, virulent, productive, and civilized. These days, alcohol drinking Lisu men and women are stigmatized by Christian and Chinese discourses that often portray them as primitive, sexually loose, poor, smelly, and dirty. These discourses are gendered, Although many Lisu women drink, men are usually the heavy drinkers. Alcohol drinking men, jipa dopa, has become a general term often used derogatorily. I'm very happy to talk more about the gender dynamics uh, in the Q&A. Um, this talk focuses, and my book, in, my book in progress generally focuses on men, uh, but I actually spend most of my time with women. But contrary to popular and Christian beliefs, alcohol dependency and alcohol-related violence emerged relatively recently. Traditionally, Lisu alcohol is made from maize. Because maize is an important staple food for humans and animals, in former times, only social elites with an abundance of maize had the resources to make alcohol. The expansion of commercial alcohol transformed Lisu relationships with it. As commercial beer and liquor became widely and cheaply available in stores and roadside commissaries in the 1980s and 1990s, addiction has become more common among Lisu. The collapse of indigenous Lisu cultural practices under Christianization and Chinese development has also disrupted the ritual context that provides structure for Lisu drinking activities. The non-Christian alcohol drinking men's attachment to alcohol takes place within this complex historical landscape. By the time I visited Gosa, 
most elders in the village identified as Christians. The alcohol drinking men whom I spent time with were the few elders in the village who remain non-Christians. There were about a dozen of them. A handful were particularly close. Uncle Zoda and his best friend, Uncle Mobi, Uncle Sapo and his two brothers, Uncle Sati and Uncle Saki, and the younger Uncle Yosa and Uncle Aki. Um, so following Lisu Ataker, I'm using Lisu kinship terms such as uncle, um, awo, and auntie Mayo to index intergenerational respect regardless of uh, formal kinship ties. They proudly proclaim themselves to be alcohol drinking men. Except for a couple of their wives, most of the women in the village were Christians. Although Christian villagers were generally on amicable terms with the non-Christian elders, the tension between the groups were obvious. During my field work, these men drank regularly. Some, like Uncle Zoda and Uncle Mobi, drank as often and as much as they could. Others drank frequently, but with more control. Uncle Sapo and his brothers, Uncle Sati and Uncle Saki, for example, who usually binge drink once or twice a month for several days, and then spend the rest of the month relatively sober. This cyclical binge drinking resembled the old drinking pattern that Auntie Yona said was common in the earlier days when men used to drink for big celebrations or for important rituals. The habits of the men were partly shaped by their own personal histories and circumstances. For example, Uncle Zoda's compulsive drinking resulted in part from the chronic pain he suffered from having endured forced sterilization under China's birth planning policy in the 1990s. His son's frequent ventures to drink away from home with his friends was in turn probably related to his father's rowdy drinking gatherings at home, which drove the son to find other venues of release. In general, older drinkers tended to enjoy liquor, while younger drinkers like Uncle Zoda's son liked beer. But old or young, all Lisu alcohol drinkers I met in Kosa and beyond preferred homemade liquor and beer. During my stay in Kosa, I lived with Uncle Zoda and Auntie Yona, who had two children, a son and a daughter. Uncle Zoda and his son were not Christian. Auntie Yona, on the other hand, was a devout Christian. Their daughter, Nana, was a Christian by default because of her gender and because of her mother's faith. Nana was my classmate and my Lisu language tutor in Minzu University in the provincial capital of Kunming, where I was enrolled as a Lisu language student. Like many younger members of the village, Nana and her brother were usually away. Nana was attending university and her brother was working in the factories in the cities. Their absence meant I tilled the fields, planted maize, weeded the grounds, scavenged for pig feed, and cut firewood alongside Auntie Yona. Through these everyday work activities, Auntie Yona taught me Lisu. As I gained facility in Lisu, I conducted most of my research in the language of my host. Although this paper focuses on Lisu men, I spent most of my days in the village with Lisu women. Uh, so this is um, the women are, uh, we're preparing the vegetables to sell it in the marketplace the next day. And I think this was already midnight by then. For many of the women, alcohol drinking husbands were the heaviest burden. As the men parted through the night, the women dealt with the everyday mundane realities. Um, like for example, uh, getting the vegetables prepared in, in midnight to sell in the market day. I did not participate in drinking alcohol, but I was often included as an observer and a welcome photographer. During these rowdy gatherings, I was frankly often tired from working in the fields, and I wish I could rest instead of attending to the men's reveries. Auntie Yona was exhausted as well. Yet I always felt there was a shared understanding between Auntie Yona and the men, as if their drinking was also a catharsis for her. Although she did not drink, she joined them as they joke and make fun of each other. Following her example, I began to listen more carefully to the drunken speech 
of the alcohol drinking ban in Kosa village. So now I'm moving on to the next section where I'm going to be talking about melancholic play uh, in the night of drinking with the men. One ordinary wintry evening, not long after the pigs were fed and the chicken feed prepared, a group of men came to visit Uncle Zoda. Heavy footsteps on the bamboo porch alerted us to their arrival. It was the usual entourage, Uncle Bobby, the man condemned by an old curse, Uncle Sapo, the retired sorcerer in the village, Uncle Api, the villager afflicted with epilepsy, Uncle Yosa, the divorcee who was captured by Burmese soldiers and presumed dead for seven years, and Uncle Aki, the widower whose wife went mad. These were Uncle Zoda's blood brothers, fellow non-Christian men who found solidarity with each other in their shared love for alcohol and the past. Andi Yona welcomed them. She served them food, which they declined, and shared Uncle Zoda's alcohol with them, which they eagerly accepted. The men had gathered to celebrate the return of Uncle Aki. Aki was the youngest of the lot and often left the village for long periods of work in construction jobs in the northern, in the northern part of the county. Actually, it was a northern county above the prefecture. Passing bottle after bottle and cup after cup of alcohol, the men chatted, laughed, sang, and cried in joy. Drink alcohol, Uncle Zoda cried. Let's talk and joke together, but no fighting, no quarreling, Uncle Sapo, the eldest of them said. Alcohol circulated continuously among them. The gathering began relatively calmly, but rose quickly to a crescendo of inebriated chaos. Loud laughter, howls reverberated through the room. Lee Su pop music videos blasted from Zoda's television, providing the shrill accompaniment to this carnivalesque scene. The incandescent bulb that hung above the flashing TV and the burning flame from the campfire cast moving shadows around the room, giving the strange effect that the house was even darker than it already was. Excited by my camera, the men insisted I take pictures of them, drunk and half naked. Zoda sharing beer with Moby in a bowl, Aki pretending to be a corpse hanging from a tree, and me pretending to share a cigarette with Aki. Each of these acts was a reference to the past. Zoda and Moby sharing a beer from the same bowl resembled the cross-cupping practice that Lisu used to perform during weddings and other celebrations. Uncle Aki pretending to be a corpse reminded me of the Lisu story about the star-crossed lovers who hanged themselves from a tree. The cigarettes were new, but they represented the traditional pipes that Lisu used to smoke. In their drunkenness, the men broadcast their skewed imaginings of the past, a liquid mix of half memories, false memories, and incomplete erroneous stories about things, people, and events that may never have actually been. I am a prophet, Uncle Zoda called out, provo provoking much laughter among the men. Bring me meat! Many of the sorcerers who converted to Christianity became Christian prophets, Habib Mupa. Uncle enjoyed making fun of these sorcerer prophets. He saw them as sorcerers trying to cheat their way into the Christians' hearts and pockets. Their true aim, he said, was to earn as much meat as possible. Tell me the next lottery number, Uncle, I joked with him. So that took a pause as if trying to find the number with his mind's eye. I don't see them, Mamoa, Zoda replied. Come back tomorrow, the laughter reverberated. The boundaries between the living and the undead blurred. The more the men drank, the closer the spirits came to them. As the men descended into alcohol madness, je peux me, their yululu, yululu speech indicated the possible presence of something other than human. Take a picture, take a picture. I am a demon here to kill humans. Wanani, soza te si. I am a demon, here to eat humans, wanani, tohua teza, shouted an alcohol mad Uncle Moby, as he insisted that I take a picture of him and Zoda. 
pretending he was holding a Lisu machete, Moby stood behind Zoda, acting like a demon about to kill an oblivious Zoda. The alcohol-mad Moby readied himself to conduct an imaginary murder. Possessed by the spirit, Moby was no longer fully present. As was common on such occasions, the absent Moby wanted a lasting trace of his demon self. My Nikon camera, with its ability to capture his absent presence, became an object of desire. In Zoda's house, spirit and men rendezvoused. Like the stigmatized men who summoned them, the spirits were beings denied recognition. Formerly powerful and respected spirits, they had turned into downtrodden, forgotten, and dismissed demons. Wronged by the circumstances of their life and death, wronged by the Christians who betrayed them, and wronged by the Chinese state that branded them as primitive superstitions, the demonized spirits were unable to rest. Identifying with these demons, the men let the spirits speak, allowing them to express the shared grievances of men and spirit. In their drunkenness, the men took on the dual role of the sorcerer seeking justice and the demon wronged by others. Rather than trying to free themselves from the spirits, they summoned them to the present. Their melancholic howls pierced the silence of the village night, jolting their Christian neighbors awake, making them listen to the sounds and sorrows of banished ancestors. As the night went on, the men descended deeper and deeper into alcohol madness, hurling insults at each other. They crooned out of tune music and gave indecipherable speeches about themselves and their past. Among the men, Moby and Zoda were the most resilient drinkers. As everyone began to wander home, Moby stayed with Zoda. The two egged each other on to drink more and play harder. The next morning, sleep deprived, Andy, Yona and I found them both unconscious. Moby lay next to the dead campfire on the floor. Zoda was sprawled on his bed, motionless. In the dead of the night, when others sleep, the men called upon the spirits with their alcohol. Together, men and spirit danced, sang, and haunted the quiet, orderly lives of their Christian neighbors. Drinking alcohol, the men's bodies became the medium through which spirits re-entered the world of the living. Dancing and singing together, spirit and men honored their ties to each other. Their despair of loss was transfigured into the joys of existence forgotten memories into living rituals, demons into ancestors, alcohol drinking men into powerful sorcerers, and death back into life. Drinking is an act of togetherness. Alcohol brought together the alcohol drinking men in Kosa as brothers with a shared commitment to, remem to remembering lost practices and forgotten ancestors. Whereas the Christians in the village sought to break away from old practices, the alcohol drinking men refused to move on. Their melancholia united them as a community against the Christian majority in the village. We are the alcohol drinking men. We work when we feel like working, stop when we feel like stopping not like those people who go to church. They are full of superstitions, Uncle Saki proudly proclaimed once, turning a typical Christian insult back at the Christians themselves. The men purposefully went against those things that Christians said and did. Christians attended church and did not work on Sundays. Non-Christians had alcohol drinking gatherings and worked any day of the week or not work. Christians did not eat the blood and internal organs of animals. Alcohol drinking men, on the other hand, prized them as delicacies. Christians considered phrases such as, thank you, shamu, forgive me, gagale, and how are you, hua hua, polite. Non-Christians found these expressions phony. The alcohol drinking uncles in Zukosa enjoyed poking fun at the Christians. 
The best time to steal meat is when Christians are saying grace before a meal. When they have their eyes shut, pick your favorite pieces of meat from the dishes. They won't even notice. And if they do, you can just call them out for not praying pro properly. Uncle Moby, Uncle Zoda's best friends, taught me once. The men's witticism expanded beyond making fun of their Christian neighbors. They made jokes about cunning Han Chinese migrants, strange foreigners, book smart but otherwise stupid university students, bewitching Burmese women, lying Christian missionaries, and greedy Chinese communist officials. Once, the government distributed each household some walnut cuttings to plant. Although walnuts are lucrative, many lease to avoid eating them. Eating too much walnut oil, they say, can turn a person into an idiot. Xi Jinping must like eating a lot of walnuts. That's why he keeps asking us to plant walnuts. No wonder he's so stupid, Uncle Zoda said, as we planted the walnut cuttings. As the men pass alcohol around, they reverse Chinese and Christian discourses of gratitude. They were no longer the ungrateful ones for rejecting the gifts of Christianity and development. It was instead the Christians who were ungrateful, having forgotten about the spirits, having abandoned their brothers and sisters, and having ultimately given up what it means to be Lisu. Breathing new life to old reciprocal ties, the men rebuilt a community from ruins from the ruins of loss and reminded their fellow villagers, Christians and non-Christians alike, that they were not yet dead, as Uncle Moby used to defiantly yell, I cannot die, Shima Da. Refusing to let go, the men held on together to fragments of what it means to be Lisu outside of Christian and Chinese civilizational frames. So I'm now going to conclude. Around two years after I left Kosa, I received a message from Nana letting me know that her father, Uncle Zoda, was critically ill. His organs were failing and he was dying. Upon receiving the news of Uncle's illness, I prepared my return to China. But as I was getting ready to go back, COVID-19 hit Wuhan and travels to China soon became impossible. Kosa village went under lockdown. Villagers were instructed to remain in their own homes and villages. I called Uncle Zoda one afternoon, aware that it might be our last conversation. I'm still here, he said almost cheerfully. Not dead yet. These days, we cannot go anywhere. Even the demons cannot move. If demons don't move, people can't move on either. I'm just hanging out, watching TV, sitting by the fire next to the demons. Not dead yet, he burst into laughter. I laughed with him. Zoda continued to play in the face of death. Melancholia once more transformed into a half funny joke. This talk has examined how low status Lisu alcohol drinking men play with melancholy as an act of refusal. Within communities struggling for their cultural and spiritual survival, like the playing with melancholia can be a mode of refusal. As I have argued, the alcohol drinking men's melancholia is a refusal because it is constituted by a playful unwillingness to let go rather than an inability to overcome. By the same token, their refusal is melancholic because it is characterized by an attachment to things that are supposed to be dead. Infusing grief with play, humor, and joy, the men draw on despair, loss, and suffering as a cultural resource for the reconstitution of community within but apart from the dominant Christian and Chinese frames of civilization. Ambivalently mixing sadness and joy, tragedy and comedy, forgetting and remembering, their melancholic play illustrates the complex contradictions constituting experiences of grief that shape intimate everyday politics.
Refusal through melancholic play speaks to cross-cultural experiences of how people recuperate and regenerate in the throes of colonial domination. Indigenous and minority communities are often portrayed as damaged victims, but there is no doubt that these communities struggle with great injustice and oppression. People face suffering not only with anger and despair, but also with humor and play. Illness and afflictions, such as alcohol dependency are symptoms of victimhood, but they are also acts through which people convey, communicate, and share their experiences. By attending to jokes and social histories of men who might be considered by public health experts as alcoholic, I pay attention to the social commentaries and historical memories they articulate through their affliction. Situating such afflictions as alcohol dependency in relation to these historical structures reverses the disease discourse. The pathology lies not in the sick person, but in the social and political structures within that illness emerge. Within which that illness emerge. Lisu alcohol drinking men's melancholic refusal provides inspiration for thinking about how to combine dark anthropology and the anthropology of the good. Proponents of the anthropology of the good critique contemporary anthropology's tendency to universalize the suffering subject, which they argue is a modern day a replacement of the savage slot. Similarly, indigenous scholars have proposed a moratorium on damage-centered research that portrays indigenous communities as only or mainly damaged. But this call to suspend damage-centered research is not about denying damage, nor about turning our attention towards only the good. Rather, it is a call for an epistemological shift in the way research is conducted and motivated. Activist anthropology in which anthropologists are directly involved in the social movements they study provides an important starting point for rethinking the theories of change undergirding research. Part of this epistemological shift towards research for change and transformation is to recognize people as complex subjects with shifting and contradictory desires, desires that simultaneously resist and reproduce power. Li Su Men's melancho melancholic alcohol drinking is constituted by such complex interplays between despair and joy and between loss and regeneration. Their melancholia is not just an embodiment of victimhood, but also the grounds on which they refuse colonialism and celebrate their survival. Theories of the subject that fully recognize such complex and contradictory desires form a critical foundation for building solidarities and for rethinking the theories of change undergirding anthropological research. Thank you. I'm ex very excited about your questions. Thank you, Thank you Ting, for a fantastic talk. Um, so we have uh, plenty of time for question and answer, but I want, I'm want i mindful of people's time. I know some people have to leave at one sometimes because of various time commitments. So I'd like to ask anyone who thinks they need to leave by one, please ask your question first. Um, otherwise, we'll just go in the order in which I see hands. So if you wanna say that you need to ask first, put it in the chat. Otherwise, we'll just go in an order. Um, is there anyone who, who has a time commitment? Otherwise, I'll just call on Al, because I see Al has a question. Um, so Al, go ahead and ask your question, and if anyone else needs to, we'll follow up with that. Hi, um, nice to meet you. I'm a PhD student here in Anthropology and Environmental Studies. I used to be at Yale and U.S., so <laughs> this is great. Um, and no, so this is fascinating, and if this is a chapter, I'm looking forward to the book, and so I'm really excited. Um, and I particularly was thinking about the ways that this is similar or different to like parts of Northern Thailand where you have the Karen, the Kachin and, the, and Burma as well, and how the Christian Buddhist narrative is actually fundamentally very different. Um, so that was kind of interesting for me to think through and compare because um, to the Christians in the village in Northern Thailand, they were like, oh, um, 
um, we're super open to Christians. The Buddhists were like the dominant people, and it's all it's all great. So it's really interesting the very clear um, reversal there um, in terms of what I'm familiar with. But sorry, my question was about ontology, um, and I'm wondering what, how you theorize ontology in a sense. So in the in in one primary sense, there's that Freudian uncanny. And then what's interesting here is I feel like the melancholia kind of comes into that kind of lack of um, inability to kind of do away with repression. So that coming back with the repression. Um, and it's really interesting and also to think about the role of the spirits then in terms of them being wrong. Um, but then kind of Andrew Johnson's book talked a lot more about ambivalence. So here the spirits seem to be a lot more active and, and angry as opposed to like a more ambivalent kind of relationship um, on the on the river. And, and in the sec another sense of ontology is this kind of social control. Um, and, and so this idea about nations being built on the zone of mass death is something like Foy Twang talks about in China. And I'm wondering how, to, to what extent you can think about ontology as um, molding kind of individual and, and, and what you're talking about in intra lisu identity, but also kind of different scales of identity in the kind of social control there. So I'm just wondering kind of like how you're thinking about, th there's so much through the ethnography that that's coming through. I'm just wondering like how, um, how you're putting all those how, uh, together. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll just respond or do you? Okay. Um, that's such a great question. Um, and I don't know if I can answer completely, do it justice. Um, um, so I think the way I'm uh, thinking about haunting is partly that indeed there is this uh, desire to move away uh, that we have overcome uh, our indigenous or our kind of uh, either it is the sinful past from the Christian perspective, or it is um, that we're, we're we're moving on from the backward Lisu practices, and we're trying to um, become modern. But that is never a complete um, complete conversion in a sense. So the uncanny, it is like an uncanny reminder that these men are living in this space, yeah, staying in this space that reminds. Um, the, the villagers and the people around them that you have never really actually, you're not really ever completely uh, modern. Um, and, and actually um, the uh, demons reside within you. Um, and so that's perhaps that haunting emerges um, in, that, in that sense. Um, and in the sense, uh, in, this, in the scale of, uh, I thought that was so interesting, the nation built on mass death because I think this is a place that is built on mass death. And so there is that scale. That's really helpful for me to think through and, and include in my next iteration of this chapter, because um, there is that scale of the village haunting, um, the men haunting the villagers by reminding them of the past. But there's also the scale in which this whole place which has been, which is being promoted as a tourist hotspot, as developed because uh, a Chinese state is um, developing this place. It's modern. It's becoming modern. There's no more poverty. Um, but um, all of that narrative is built on so much death in the region, cultural death, the cultural death of the men um, that that I've described, but also the physical death of the people who are dying in traffic accidents, who are dying in construction work, who are dying in landslides who are dying because of family problems and suicide and mental health and alcoholism and sickness and cancer and other kinds of new diseases that were never there in the first place, but have recently become, um, for some reason, like other parts of the world, um, development is correlated with uh, the rise of all these non-communicable diseases. And so there is that level at the level of that scale that you're talking about where development is actually built on mass death. And, and in a sense, um, this place is, is a haunted by that, that death that is also being repressed by the, the discourse of development. And that's really helpful. Um, and I think there's a third level of haunting where I'm trying to think about, which is almost to bracket out the question of, trying to bracket out the question of the demons and whether I can even understand what they're doing. Um, and and there's a part of the, the, the chapter that um, I'm, I, I wasn't able to include because of time. Uh, where um, Uncle Moby passes away, uh, but he returns in the form of dreams and uh, spirits. Um, and it's almost like he continues to refuse to die even after death. And so there's that, there's that openness that, um, that I, I'm not sure if I want to allow for a closure to analyze what's actually happening there. 
um, what is, is Uncle Bobby actually coming back or, or is this like an uncanny thing? But I, I think I'm trying to see how his death actually created this ripple effect and um, regenerates a lot of discourse around haunting um, that I, I'm not quite sure I, I should, um, I, maybe I should refuse to theorize it too, too, too rigorously. So maybe allowing the, the ethnography to, to haunt itself a bit, I guess, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Thank you, Ting. Um, does anyone have a question? I have several questions, but I'm mindful. I want to make sure other people have the chance to ask. But if if there's not one at the moment, I will I'll, I will ask one first and then follow up later. Um, so Ting, this is a fantastic talk, very interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, directions to go that I'm interested in, but I wanna talk a little bit about sort of the micropolitics and spatial organization of these places in, in the valley where you were working in the villages. Um, I'm curious um, if you're doing this kind of research and there's such a kind of um, negative stereotype of the alcohol drinking Lisu men among the Christian uh, Lisu. Um, when you fall into a group of men doing field work, right, uh, or or families that have men of this nature, um, does that end up precluding the possibility of working with Christians, and or or how does that ne get ne negotiated? And that raised my other question, sort of just ethnographic description a little bit. Um, about the Christianity in the area and the spatial organization of villages, like are there sort of like spatial arrangements and where you know these men live in a separate part or even sort of on the outskirts outside or anything like that or forms of exclusion? Um, and also in terms of the actual Christian conversion process, um, are people born Christian or do they convert? And the reason I ask that is because some of what you're describing, you know, when in American 12-step programs and all these things, there's a lot of literature that shows the parallel to conversion. And there's a lot of Christian language in those processes. And sometimes when I was listening to you, I was thinking, well, the, the way in which some of the Christians are responding to the alcoholism sounds kind of similar to like the way a, 12, a member of a 12-step program might speak of it. And so that, that made me wonder, if some of the Christians themselves had been former drinkers and, and this kind of reaction to it is based on these kinds of dynamics. So there's a lot in there, but mainly I wanna hear a little bit more about the micro relations of Christians and non-Christians and also how that affected you as a field worker. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, the, the Micropolitics were, were complicated to navigate. Um, so uh, actually, I think it was the other way around um, that when I first started working, I, I worked a lot with Christians or I, 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 my first uh, visit to the New River Valley was working with Christian missionaries. And I felt that during those early visits, oftentimes I was precluded from talking with uh, non-Christians or they were like don't talk to them or the Christians would, would move away and I as uh, I would follow the Christians and even though I was actually very curious to talk to the non-Christians um, and at times I think earlier on I think I was biased by um, uh, some Christian perceptions as well often thinking oh these uh, people um, they are why, why don't they not drink so so um, I think uh, it took a lot of my own having to uh, interrogate those assumptions as well, which were the assumptions of the people that I was uh, working with from at the beginning. And so, so it took years to kind of like then build relationships with the Christian communities um, and, um, and then uh, work with non-Christians and, and still like have that trust with the Christians that I'm, um, I'm not an alcohol drinker. Um, and so I think that was actually, this was actually something I was thinking today that um, I, it was easier for me to be, I wonder how it would have been like if I had gone to the field and just been really stubborn and said, I drink alcohol and I'm not Christian and I'm just going to hang out with the, the non-Christians. But I, I did not, that was not my starting point. The starting point was um, I'll go to church 
I'll do the rituals with you. Um, I'm not Christian, but I will um, I, I will follow the, the steps and, and be included in, in your conversation and be willing to listen and learn about uh, the Bible. Um, and then that 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 starting point then allowed me the, the non-Christians allowed me to talk to them. Uh, but I, I think if it was the other way around, that if I started as a non-Christian, I'm not so sure if the Christian communities will be so welcome, uh, welcoming to me. Um, so, so because I started with the Christian communities, then it, it was difficult to, to get out into talking to the non-Christians uh, because there were lots of gatekeeping, uh, but, it, but the non-Christians were welcoming uh, and were willing to talk. And ultimately, uh, uh, after a lot of kind of negotiation, it was, it was, it was fine. Um, although I think because I was living in a, in a household where the, the women were Christian, um, so in that sense, I, I had to respect the women and, and, and also navigate being open to hanging out with the men, but also uh, respecting auntie for wanting to, she want, uh, to go to church and to um, not drink alcohol with the men. The villages, um, so all these micro politics play out in very ritualistic ways as well. So even though the villagers in everyday ways, they they kind of do get along with each other, um, but uh, they they don't eat um, Christian Christians don't eat the meat of non Christians. So if the non Christian had a funeral or um, uh, a family member in the non Christian's house had a funeral um, or a wedding, the Christians cannot consume the eat meat of the the the, uh, the non Christian. So even though in an everyday way uh, people kind of get along with each other um, in the kind of structural way. Or in the ritual setting, this, this, these uh, boundaries are very clearly drawn, and um, and in the kind of backstage, um, the conversations do take place where the Christians are critiquing the non-Christians, and then the non-Christians are critiquing the Christians. And I think um, being with a, a Christian um, friend, uh, Auntie Yona, I think it was possible to listen to both sides, and so that was uh, that was Auntie Yona and her being open-minded be with both groups um, and allowing 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 conversations to take place in between the groups the oh i can go on about the micropolitics because it also affects kind of uh the, the village dynamics uh so the village has a whole hierarchy system and then the men have their own hierarchy system so when the men were conducting uh, work parties they would follow their own set their own hierarchies of who are the seniors and the, the Christians will follow some of the other hierarchies. And so it's almost like they have two different bubbles, but intersecting. The spatial arrangements, um, yeah, that's really interesting because I did not think about it. But in fact, it is so true that uh, the Christians tend to be, the non-Christians tend to be living away from the Christians further out. Um, and um, the, the, where the non-Christians were living, were ten, the people tend to consider they were near haunted sites. Um, I did not consider that that was connected directly to um, alcohol drinking, but um, it, it, I think there is some sort of connection. So um, that uh, the people are often like their, their pathways that go towards a, a non-Christian's household and there will be a haunted site or there's uh, a, a kind of uh, tombs around the, the, the places where the non-Christians reside. But this whole arrangement now is, uh, I understand it is completely changed since uh, I was last able to visit because of the Wong Belt One Road Initiative, uh, which runs through the village. And so all the villages who are living by the roads I have to move up into the villages, into the mountains. Uh, I wasn't working deep into the mountains, but somewhere in the middle. Um, and so um, so now all the spatial arrangements um, are, are, are messed up. And Auntie Yona was saying, next time I come back, I won't be able to recognize people's houses because everybody's living next to each other. Um, it's very crowded now, that's what I, I sense. And the 12 step thing is so accurate. I, that's so great, thank you. Yes, a lot of the men were alcohol drinkers. And in that sense, there's a haunting there as well because they're haunted by, I guess, the desire. And so there's a very strong kind of, uh, we are, we're going to reject the alcohol drinkers, but most of the villagers were alcohol drinkers. And it's only in the last 20 years um, that this um, Christianity has picked up in this particular village. Thanks, Ting. While we're on this topic, there's two brief uh, statements uh, or questions in the chat from Larry Ashman and Jared Bateman. 
or Beitman, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but um, you, can you read those yourself or would you like them to read it or? Oh, I can, I, I can read it. Um, okay. Or, uh, and you so can see the chat. Yeah. Larry is asking about whether the men were surprised uh, I was a woman and interested in their drinking. Um, there, there were alcohol drinking women in the village, a couple of their uh, uncle Moby's wife um, was kind of a lapsing Christian, um, and Uncle Yosa's wife uh, was not a Christian until until Uncle Yosa eventually converted to Christianity, and then she followed him. Um, so women drinkers are not um, are not unheard of. Um, I felt that they were not so much surprised, and I think I wasn't actually, it was kind of organic. I, I didn't really start it off very interested. I think I started off very annoyed because I was like, oh, why do I have to stay up and listen to you drinking? Um, but then I think it took some time for me to to listen with Auntie Yona. Um, she's always so generous and, and patient. Um, and then I, I think what they, it was very much a spectacle. Um, so it was very much kind of, I want you to see this. I want you to take pictures of me and, and even um, got a bit angry when sometimes I was so tired, I didn't want to take pictures anymore. Um, and so I think maybe not so much, maybe, um, yeah, maybe I think they, they were not so much surprised as wanting to be heard I think it was surprising for them that I wanted to learn Lisu language because it's always considered so, I mean, uh, why would you study Lisu? It's so useless by the Chinese government's kind of um, um, propaganda. But actually many of these non-Christian Lisu men were not as surprised as the Christians about why I wanted to learn Lisu. For them, it was, they, we have a lot of skills. We have a lot of knowledge. Why wouldn't you want to learn from us? It's so strange that my kids don't want to learn from me. Um, and so I think, Maybe uh, it, they are surprised that younger generation people are not taking them more seriously. Does that answer the question? Sorry, I accidentally pressed the mute button on you, Ting, so I didn't mean to do that. I was meaning to press my own mute button, unmute myself. But there was a quick question from Jared, and then uh, there's a hand up from William Julian. Um, so if you could just go in that order. You'll have to unmute yourself because I accidentally pressed your mute button. It's not your fault, it's my Sorry. fault. Sorry, thanks. No, no, um, my fault too, I didn't notice. Um, um, yeah, the meat prohibition is really interesting. Um, ethnographically, um, I, I, I think, uh, well, ethnographically, so um, the idea is that Christians are not allowed to eat um, the meat of non-Christians because it will make them sick. Um, that they, it's it's kind of a betrayal of a promise that you made to God, um, and that you will be punished. Um, and and there were stories about men who um, the one that I'm the ones that I'm thinking of are all men. Um, and and um, so the alcohol drinking men who converted to Christianity, but then uh, um, ate um, the meat of um, in, of a non-Christian um, died of um, some uh, a, a tummy problem. He, he couldn't stop uh, going to the bathroom. And another one wasn't to do with um, Christianity so much and non-Christianity was there was a Christian who ate the meat of a, um, of a wild animal. And actually it might not even to do with, I, I'm not so sure if the person was Christian, but the Li Su person uh, ate the meat of a wild animal, a big wild animal. And, um, and wild animals are supposed to have spirits in them and that spirit eventually killed the Li Su person. So there are these stories about meat that, that can be eaten and cannot be eaten um, along the lines of Christian and along the lines of uh, Li Su versus the spirits as well. Um, I think, it's something to do, my, my instinct is to think that it's something to do with reciprocity. And um, because one of the stories is that uh, Lisu actually have an agreement with the spirits um, to always be giving meat to the spirits. Um, if the Lisu stops uh, providing uh, meat to the spirits, then uh, the Lisu person will fall ill. 
but it's been many, many years uh, since Christians provide meat to uh, the spirits. And so perhaps it's something about um, allegiances and betrayal um, and um, and what and and the in the punishments for for not meeting those reciprocal ties. Um, I'm sorry, does that answer a little bit? I think this is something that I'm also working on and trying to make sense of too. No, that was a great reply, Ting. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm mindful of the time, everybody, although Ting said that sometimes she doesn't like staying up taking pictures of people, I should remind everyone that it's 1 a.m. over there in Singapore where she's uh, dialing in. So I wondered if um, the, the next to Julian, I didn't mean, to make you disappear, um, but it, oh, sorry. Um, I was gonna say that Julian and Tui could ask their questions at once, but that may have made Julian disappear. I didn't mean it in that way, but anyhow, Tui, can you ask the last question before we say goodbye? Okay, sorry, uh, it's too late there. Um, it's nine, uh, 10 a.m. here, so it's perfect here. <laughs> so sorry for that. Um, uh, I listen to you to the uh, to your research. I uh, it reminds me about Vietnam, uh, the Mekong Delta, where I work. It's exactly the same when I first came there from Ho Chi Minh City. And so the men drinking and lay is exactly the same. So my question is, I have a lot of questions in mind, but we don't have time. I just have one question for now. Like the women's attitudes, like based on my observation in the Mekong Delta, like 20 years ago when the economic development, like women didn't go outside. They stay in the village, in the village and then like, they enjoy the men's drinking. Uh, sometimes they complain, but they enjoy. So through drinking, men empower themselves through drinking. And women enjoy it. And women prepare food for them, buy, like, it, it encourage them to drinking. Like, they don't complain. They didn't complain. But when economic de developed, uh, women went outside for, for, job, uh, for job income. They, they they don't like it anymore. So they so I don't I'm not sure that's about Vietnam. They were in the Mekong Delta. So I'm not sure what happened there based in in, in the area where you research. And like because you talk about development, the the discourse and environment. So how that influenced the women's attitude and the man men attitude. Men stay the same, I think, in the Mekong Delta. Men still enjoy drinking, but women they change because of development. That's my question. I have a lot, but just one. Yeah, th thank you. That's so interesting. Um, that's so interesting. Um, so after development, they actually stop enjoying the men drinking. It's so interesting. <laughs> um, I think um, this, what in my in, in where I'm working, I think. Um, uh, the women in general, if they are Christians, they they generally um, they they generally really perform not liking um, men drinking. But backstage, uh, they do drink, um, kind of like on special occasions, and they have like their special alcohol beer. Um, and then they'll be like, okay, secret, secret, don't tell anybody. Um, and and I I take pleasure in that because like I actually want to drink a lot of times, and um, so I I, I don't. Um, I don't tell people because I want to continue drinking too. Um, so, so then I think there was also this incident that was very interesting because I think I feel like Auntie Yona was kind of that way where she really enjoyed hanging out with the men drinking. Um, and actually, there was a period of time, um, and and so did her daughter and a lot of other women too. They like you know they, they outwardly they really perform how they don't like alcohol drinking men, but then when it comes to hanging out with alcohol drinking men, some of them really seem to be having a lot of fun with the men. And in fact, when Uncle Zoda stopped um, stopped drinking for a while because he was um, he was he was very um, uh, shocked by um, Uncle Moby's death and really worried about himself because the villagers often say that death in the village I work with come in pairs. So he was really worried about his life and he stopped drinking for a while. And it was almost as if Auntie Yona was very disappointed. Auntie Yona and Nana seem almost disappointed that he was no longer drinking. So, um, so there's, there's that, I think maybe it's similar. Um, but I haven't really come across 
how women coming back and they don't like men drinking, but I, I feel like a lot of time women come back and in fact, they, they drink themselves. Um, um, so kind of the migration patterns um, change. Uh, the, a lot of people become not Christian after they come back from migrating in the, in the cities. It's so interesting, <laughs> the changes. Um, I'd like to kind of gracefully bring it to a close, but I'm mindful that there's one last question from Dini about the, the experiences with women while men are drinking. So if you wanted to say just a really quick reply to that, then I'll stop the recording and then uh, we can kind of uh, linger a little bit if anyone likes to, but I do want to bring it to a close since it's so late over there. Yeah, so um, a very, uh, yeah, so mostly women, um, Christian women are working very hard. Um, so everyday chores, uh, taking care of the pigs, uh, going to look for pig food, uh, looking for firewood, uh, even managing all the bureaucracy because uh, Chinese government uh, often have to fill in forms. You have to go down to the uh, village brigade and if you can't write, you have to find somebody who can write, who can communicate, who can... got into fights and she had to deal with that. So uncle was often, um, yeah, just drinking and um, and she, she would have to deal with all that. And so it's very gendered and very patriarchal. And when he was drunk, he often would even try to stop her from relaxing. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I, that's something I, I, I think it's, um, this is not, this is, it is an affliction. It's not, it's not uh, easy for anybody to be in that space. Um, I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I, at the same time as trying not to romanticize drinking, um, I think it's also important to, to hear this other angle, but I think it is from the women's perspective, it can be very frustrating. Um, and uh, from, from a Christian woman like Auntie Yona's perspective, who has to deal with so much, so much of the mundane everyday life. And it's so interesting, it's so gendered that the men take to get to take the spectacle, the sport of the spectacle, whereas the women are in the mundane and the boring. And, and I end up writing about the spectacle rather than the mundane. So I, I, yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you, Vinny. Well, um, thank you, Ting, for a fantastic talk. I, I hope everyone can join me in thanking you for just this wonderful presentation and great Q&A session as well. Thank, thank you, you very for much. the chance and thank you for the great questions. So helpful for me, mm -hmm. really helpful.